the 2018 general elections the issues that matter the people that matter this is straight talk with vj narayan by extra supermarket Bulovinaka, good evening and namaste to all of you on Straight Talk tonight. Back again uh, for yet another live talk back in studio tonight. Uh, VTFM, uh, we have uh, uh, three parties, uh, three representatives from three parties tonight. The uh, first one uh, ever on Straight Talk uh, where we have three party representatives. So that's another step up and uh, we have uh, the Fiji First uh, Representative uh, Premila Kumar, uh, we have uh, Sini Nambo of National Federation Party and Linda Tambuya of Sodelpa. Ladies, good evening and thank you very much on behalf of our listeners on VTFM and others who have joined us on VTFM and also on Facebook Fiji Village. We're going live also on video through Fiji Village. So first of all, uh, thank you very much for accepting the invitation to come and talk about the policies and why you were standing in the elections of 2018. Thank you, Vijay. So before we start off, uh, just uh, we've uh, got confirmation uh, this evening also of yet another straight talk uh, uh, talk back that's coming up, and that will be on November 11th at. Uh, 6 p.m. Uh, we've got confirmation from uh, Fiji First uh, Leader and Prime Minister Vorenge Banimarama. He will be in studio uh, with Sodelpa Leader Mr. Sitiveni Rambuka. So that will be from 6 to 7 p.m. on uh, uh, November 11th. That will be in the Ito K language and then uh, they take a 30 minute break and they'll be back at 7.30 p.m. onwards uh, for straight talk in English. So that's <laughs> happening at uh, uh, 6 p.m. starting with the Ito K language from 6 to 7 and then 7 p 7.30 p.m. onwards uh, on straight talk on November 11th. So uh, stay with us as we have uh, more confirmations coming in as well. Now, uh, as we start off, uh, how's been the campaign uh, uh, for you, uh, Premila? Uh, it is quite intense, uh, everyday affair, a very limited sleep, but I'm quite uh, sure that we'll get there. Sini? Um, hectic, uh, to be expected. Uh, we're, all, we're approaching the finish line now, but thank God for makeup, eh? Bulavinaka, namaste, and for Xia Fiji. Certainly the campaign uh, period that is now we are in has been an enjoyable uh, you know, very hectic, as the ladies have said, but quite rewarding. It's been really wonderful being in touch with uh, the people and uh, learning of and hearing of their issues. And uh, two weeks from today, two weeks from today, ladies, it's going to be over. So, you know, we, we certainly have to just make the most of this last leg and carry on. Thank you. Now, I'll start off with Linda. Why get into politics? You tried in 2014 with PDP and uh, then uh, you, PDP tried to continue after the elections. They did not make the 5% threshold and uh, then uh, you and uh, Mr. Vijay Singh uh, decided to move on uh, to uh, Sodelpa. Mr. Vijay Singh is uh, Vice President of Sodelpa and you a candidate of Sodelpa. Uh, why get into politics? Thank you. Uh, you know, for me, getting into politics is really to fight. Uh, you know, I um, believe uh, that if you passionately feel something and you want to go for it, then, you know, if you're there to fight for something, then you should. And for me, it's really to fight for, you know, the weak and the disadvantaged and those that are voiceless and those that are helpless. And I'd like to be the voice um, of those people. You know, um, I grew up poor. Um, I don't want anyone else to. And my fight has always been against poverty, and that's why I'm here. Uh, you know, certainly with PDP competing in uh, 2014 elections, uh, we didn't make it. We were the highest party, though, right below the threshold. And for a very high 5% threshold, we had to be practical this time around, because this election system only allows um, for those that meet the 5% threshold to get in. So really being realistic is uh, to join uh, a bigger party that would make our votes count, unlike because it disadvantages smaller parties. So um, Sodelpa was at the end uh, the choice for us because our, our policies align. You believe you will make it into parliament this time? I certainly hope so. Premila, why get into politics? Well, Vijay, as you know, I've served as the CEO of Consumer Council uh, for almost 12 years. And over the years, I have come across people. I understood their needs. 
I understood their problems, and I've been serving the disadvantaged uh, and the vulnerable group. But the main reason being, as, as a CEO of Consumer Council, my job was policy-related work. So I had to advocate for policy changes. I had to lobby for policy changes. Now, I was doing this outside, and parliament is the place for policy making. So I'd rather be in the parliament to get the things done immediately than to lobby for years to get the change done. Because, you know, with policy making, you have to put the issue on the agenda, and then the acceptance of that uh, understanding of that issue, and then there's a realization that something needs to be done. And only after that, then they start changing the policy, changing the law, bringing in new laws. So I feel that I need to be in Parliament so that I can do this job more effectively and quickly. You're confident Fiji First will uh, uh, run government again after tw uh, November 14th? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, now, uh, National Federation Party, of course, uh, you are also the Vice President of the party, Sedi Nambo. Why get into politics? Well, Vijay, why not? I mean, I was inspired to stand for politics in 2014. Um, of course, when we do these things, it's up to the people to assess whether you're worthy or not. I'm st standing again in 2018 uh, because I'm more re-inspired that after 12 years, no offence, Pramila, but it's time to show Vijay first the doors. We are on straight talk, aren't we? Oh, yeah, yes. of course. You okay. don't have to ask again. Cool. <laughs> no uh, permission required. Okay, and, and further to that, uh, Vijay, um, the, what I have seen in the, in the four years of this government, I've been um, involved in the parliamentary work of NFP. I have not found any of their leadership inspiring in parliament, so that's another inspiration for me. <laughs> You believe you'll be second time lucky this time? I certainly do. Now, on to why you chose the particular parties that you represent. I'll start off with Premila. Why choose Fiji First? Why Fiji First? Fiji First is a very dynamic party. It is led by a visionary leader. A leader that is working towards modernizing Fiji. A leader who has removed uh, discrimination. A leader who has created equality, stability and security. And Fiji First Party <coughs> is one party where I believe in their values and particularly their mission. Let me tell you, the mission is to create a fair and just society where the benefits of progress is shared by everyone. And that is truly reflected in the social protection policy as well as in the economic empowerment policies. So that is the best platform for me. And that is the best party for me. Premier Kumar there from uh, Fiji First, Seni Nambo of NFP. Why choose NFP? I liked NFP in 2014 because it has a long-standing history. Not a lot of people realize the footprint of NFP. There was a lot of groundbreaking stuff that they did in the 60s by Mr. Edi Patel, such as the Housing Authority, USP. I like that they have been at the forefront of political contributions in this country. So I believe in their values and philosophies. In the Tambuya, why Sodelpa? I'd explained earlier, um, as the leader of the People's Democratic Party, about the practicality of fighting these elections as a small party and needing to come into a bigger ship to fight um, the elections. But, um, you know, with due respect to um, my colleague Pramila, uh, claiming about removing discrimination, you know, um, discrimination is even more rife than ever. You know, we have, um, you know, the cries of workers, workers who live under minimum wage that uh, are struggling day to day from paycheck to paycheck to make ends meet. You know, we have um, students who, you know, uh, barely learn to drive but uh, having to deal with uh, um, loans, student loans the size of mortgages. Um, you know, you only have to see the stories of, of uh, you know, our people that um, having to deal with mortgages now that they have short-term contracts. Uh, you know, we have a lot of stories about e-ticketing that has been imposed on our people. Uh, you know, certainly discriminated those that take the bus because they don't have a choice. They have to take long lines at Vodafone or whatever outlet. And then they need to, um, you know, have their <coughs> cards topped up. If they, they have to buy a disposable card and then their balances run out. Um, you know, if they don't use it, it runs out, it expires. So here we have a majority of people that take the bus and are usually 
uh, people um, you know that uh, don't have uh, motor vehicles that are discriminated against and that is a huge chunk of our population so with due respect there is discrimination and we need to address that and we need uh, people to fight for that and that's what Sadelpa stands for we're going to offer cash um, instead of just uh, cards for e-ticketing, uh, we're going to ensure that long-term contracts are installed again. We're going to ensure that uh, you know that we raise the minimum wage to four dollars an hour, so that we can take care of our disadvantage. We'll talk about minimum wage, but uh, you have a right to respond <coughs> there about e-ticketing oh. because she's gone from why she joined to e-ticketing. To the so issues, right actually. To yeah. And, and that's what Sadalpa stands for, apart from being the only party that uh, fights for um, indigenous rights, which are human rights. Uh, let me start off with the uh, uh, wages that she has spoken about. Uh, I think there is a limited understanding here. Even though a person is earning uh, and they are unskilled workers, uh, one has to appreciate minimum wage was never introduced by anyone. It was introduced by this Fiji First government. It was never there. People could pay any amount of money to anybody. And we are talking about unskilled workers. Now, you are saying that they really don't have uh, enough on their plate. Let me tell you, whatever wages they are getting, it is backed up by social wages that the government is giving. The electricity is subsidized. The water is subsidized, right? There are other facilities that is given to them. So if you add up all that, like free education, bus fare, yeah, uh, as well as food vouchers, uh, plus pension, uh, pension given to the elderly. If you add up all that, that compensates. So that's uh, to do with the um, wages. Now let's go to the tells. Now for the tells... Have we covered tells yet? I'm sorry. She did mention it. We'll go to tells later because it's a big issue on its own. Okay. But because you've talked about minimum wage, we, we, we will stick to uh, issues, ladies, so that mm. if not, we'll be here all night talking about a whole lot of issues and going round and round in circles. So let's talk about minimum wage. Now, Premila has said that uh, social wages also compensates for other areas. What do you think, Zaini? Well, of course, Premila is going to say that because that those are all part of the Fiji First packages. As you know, we are insisting on a $5 minimum wage. I understand about the classifications. Even that is problematic, and there needs to be part of the consultations for the institution of um, the $5 minimum wage. We need to look at the laws, because you're classifying people as being unskilled, who are actually very skilled. House girls, I know this is probably going to come up as well. I can't be a house girl because I'm not trained the way the house girls will be if they're going to demand things like $5 an hour. Can I be a gardener tomorrow? No, but they're considered as unskilled. So these kinds of classifications will need to be worked on in the law. But to say a blanket thing like 268 is enough, is probably not appropriate. What and that's not what the people are... My what? question was on also on social wages. Sure. What will NFP do? Will they continue with the social wages? What do okay. they think of the social wages? Well, in terms of the e-ticketing, because I think that was mentioned... Let's talk about minimum wage first, then we'll move to e-ticketing. I e think we're going but that everywhere, part, so... But that was part of her response. No, 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 no she hasn't responded on e-ticketing. Let's stick to minimum wage, please, and social wages. So can you repeat your question? Because I got confused by the social... What does the wages. NFP think of the social wages, and will NFP continue with the can social wages? Can you define wages? what a social wage is? As she had said, all the, the free bus benefits. fare, the mm. yeah, electricity subsidy, the Which water subsidy... Which is why subsidy. I said about e-ticketing. No, e-ticketing is a separate issue. We'll look at e-ticketing later. We're talking about because e-ticketing is not a subsidy issue. Sure. Okay, so in terms of, for example, the free bus fare, it's not free, free. It's only for those low-income workers be um, below $16,000. Now, does that uh, enable families to put more into their food basket when they go training, uh, shopping? I don't believe so. I think there's a correction to be needed. It's about 30000 household income. 16,000, I think, for 30,000 household income. Okay, well, do you believe that uh, families are able to put for more in their food trolleys Let me with tell those you. social wages? And what research do you have to back that up with? Uh, you have to go to the Consumer Council website. We have done that work. Because the, food, uh, the VAT was reduced from 15 to 9%, there's a huge reduction in millions of products that are sold. 
on the supermarket shelves. Okay, but you're not here as consumer council anymore. No, no, no. And in you fact, you have You asked two me budgets. whether I have done as, the research as or not. As a CEO for and consumer council. And that's why I'm replying so, to your question. But you are not here as consumer council. I'm not. You asked me whether I researched. But that is consumer done. council research. It is not government research. What do you mean? Consumer council is a statutory body. It comes under the government. Get that one right. Let's well, move on to Linda. Social wages. Yes. Specific answer, straight answer, please. Thank you. If DJ. not, I will interrupt you, Linda. Well, social uh, wages. Now, now, what do you think of social wages? And will Sodelpa continue with it? Look, social wages is not something that this government came up with. This has been introduced by previous governments. There has been free education by previous governments and also subsidies. So uh, to claim that this government is the first one to initiate it is incorrect. Secondly, which uh, which programs are you saying were already there? Well, free education, for example. Uh, I think I think you need to explain what free education was offered during yes. that time. Yes, it was tuition free. It was. It was. It, it was. The free school fees came into effect around. I think around 2012. No, it was before that. The government, the previous governments, had offered. Uh, you know, uh, there was remission education. of fees. Uh, there was remission of fees. Uh, we well, have uh, we have checked this. There was remission of fees for those who <coughs> could qualify, but it wasn't free school fees in this current form. Well, certainly, but it's still a form of uh, a break for those that need uh, at the time uh, to be able to afford education, be able to send their children to school, and so. It is incorrect to say that this government is the first one to initiate any kind of breaks when it comes to education. And so, yes, this government, Sodalpa, will continue free education. It is important. Education is important. Now, uh, you know, uh, Pramila stated about other social wages. Um, one thing that, uh, you know, I'd like to, uh, uh, you know, bring up about uh, the promises of Fiji First was, uh, you know, to remove uh, VAT from all basic food items. And this was promised in the 2014 manifesto, and it has not been done. Now, that's, that's again another form of social wage. Another thing that uh, this government has failed to do, they have promised the free medicine scheme, which my colleague, with due respect, uh, was, um, you know, was uh, against it because there were 172 medicines that were not available in the pharmacies when they instituted that. So Pramila was the one that said, and, and it's on record in Parliament, that she opposed it because those medicines were not available. And so why even say it's free? So to bring up that free things are amount to social wages when this government has not met things so necessary, like medicine, and um, the other that I mentioned is, I? Uh, is uh, you know, is incorrect. So, so what let's let's go back to the social wages issue because it has been brought up by you um, in yeah, relation to the Pramila, actually. Actually, as I said, it has <coughs> been brought up by uh, Mrs. Kumar. Right. Uh, now, Pramila, just in relation to that, list down the social wages, and so that the two ladies can tell our listeners what yeah. they will continue with. Let's go forward and what you will continue with rather than who brought it and what will happen here and there. Well, Avijay, Let's I think go it with needs that. to be clear because this term of social wage is something new when we were talking about minimum wage. So, yes, I'm quite willing to listen to Pramila about what Sure, she sure, sure. Uh, can I get the opportunity to correct some of the inaccuracies that was given out? Uh, the VAT. Okay. The Fiji First Party's manifesto talked about reducing uh, VAT or retaining um, the removal of VAT on those basic food items, Correct. which were seven in number. It was in the 2014 Correct. manifesto. But instead, what this party did, they reduced the VAT from 15 to 9 percent, right? And when so they not zero. No, no. As promised. No, no. I'm talking about overall basket of goods, everything on the shelf, whether you're buying clothes, shoes, everything else. So what they did, they reduced it from 15 to 9%, and what it meant was the government lost a revenue of $340 million. By applying 9% VAT on those VAT-exempted items, they gained $100 million. And if you minus the two, it means that $240 million remained in the people's pocket. So which is better? Because at the end of the day, you don't run your house with these seven or eight items, right? I mean, it's very obvious. When you go shopping, what all do you buy? 
you buy potato, you buy onion, you buy garlic. And all these items were copying 15% VAT. So now with the removal or reduction, there is a huge gain. So obviously one has to move with a lot more precision, with a lot more conviction. And that's what Fiji first has Let's done. go to that list, Premila, uh, okay. before we run out of time. Okay, for the What's list... What's your list? And we'll right. ask NFP and Sodelpa whether, we, whether they will continue with that. Okay. <coughs> the first one on the list is definitely the income tax. Income previously, tax previously, one had to pay 31% if you're earning 8,800. Now, if you're earning 30,000 and below, you don't pay any tax, zero tax. So there is a huge gain there. Okay, we'll go listen. NFP, will you continue with the income tax threshold at 30,000? Uh, that will be made clearer tomorrow when we announce our manifesto you in Vunamono Hall. You can't say that at I the moment? I cannot say at the moment. Okay. We will maintain that. You will maintain that. Then the electricity subsidy. If, if the household income is 30,000 and below, they're getting, uh, they have to pay only 17 cents per unit for the first 100 kilowatts. NFP? We will confirm that tomorrow. We are actually going to do even better, and it's not just the subsidy, but looking at a break altogether for those that earn under 30000 Details of that? Basically, what Sudapa will do is to ensure that those that qualify for free electricity is made available to them. So there would be some under the thresh under the 30000 that would be entitled to it, but they would have to be qualified to receive that free electricity. And I'm talking about those that live way under the poverty line. And th the subsidies will continue for those that earn from 16 to 30, because really, by giving tax breaks from 16,000 to 30,000, you really affected only about 14,000 people. But we're looking at those that live below the poverty line, that live in poverty, that cannot afford Thank you, Linda. electricity. Thank you, Linda. Pramila? I, I understand anyone who is below earning below 10,000 is definitely in that poverty line and they are taken care of. But going on, 10,000 gallons of water, which is given free. Mm. You want to ask that question? Or? NFP? We'll confirm tomorrow. Sodelpa. It's the same for Sodelpa. I mean, you're again looking at a basic need and whatever that they have provided in terms of subsidies, Sodelpa will increase it. PJ, could I just okay. ask a question in, in terms of all the stuff that you've listed? So this sure. is your current policy. You will not change. Oh, we will continue with this. All right. Okay, we let's continue, continue because our listeners want to know better. what will stay and what will go. So that's why I'm asking okay. the question. And then the free education. Let me correct that. Free education up to secondary school was never, ever given by any government previously. I think we are forgetting that when our children were going to school, we had to fork out their bus fares as well as the tuition fee. Now, all that has gone. <coughs> so, in other words, your children are going to school free. That's great. I mean, Plus that's great that it's books free. Are, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but I'm just still, people still have to deal with a minimum wage and affording the so high cost of living and prices to be able to so afford to send their kids to school. So, this is where the social school. wage is offsetting that minimum wage she's talking about. Okay, free school fees. Will you continue <coughs> with it? for our listeners to know That NFP? will be confirmed tomorrow, but I just want to say that this, uh, this notion about free education, it's not exactly free. I mean, you've got to send them to school, school lunches. I'm saying free school fees. I'm responding to what she said about <coughs> free education. Well, free school fees. Will you continue with it? Uh, confirm tomorrow, Vijay. Okay, so Delpa? So Delpa is gonna continue with it. We'll even do better. We're going to make tertiary uh, education into scholarships, all tails will be removed and we will convert them into scholarships and they only have to pay back by time. We'll talk about tails uh, later on. Now, what else you have that people need to know? Okay, also the, the medication, free medication from January next year, free medication that is 172 items listed under free medication will be available from a private pharmacy and and people earning 30,000 and below, they can access, access it directly. <laughs> that from the proves private, the point. The, I mean, from, the again, private, from the private pharmacy, and they will be billing it to the government. NFP? That's the policy at place. We know that it's not working. We'll have a lot to say about that tomorrow as well in our manifesto announcement. Again, there is no point 
There is no point in offering free medication if the pharmacies are not stocked and you will talk to any doctor now and they will tell you there is a lack of this medication so people are actually going to buy. They are buying. And who benefits the private pharmacies? Because it's not available at the government pharmacies. And, so and, and that's to say the that it's available from 1st Jan, you that have is 12 reason, years to do this. That is the reason it. why... And you were right when I was complaining about that Correct. issue. And that's why there is what a policy. Happened, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. There is a policy change. Previously, the government used to stock the private pharmacies for them to sell this medication. Now they don't have to stock. In other words, the private pharmacies will be selling their medication to these people and they'll be billing it to the government. They're already doing it. They're already the, buying from the private pharmacies because the government doesn't I'm, stock it. I'm talking so about why call the it previous... Free? Previous policy free? and now the new policy that has it come sounds about. It's all the same. So now the it private is not pharmacies the same. will benefit. So it is definitely our, not the same. For the benefit of our listeners and viewers, when was this new policy implemented? It and was it was announced in the budget. We all heard that. And when it was it, it was announced it's in the now budget. In, the mo in motion now. It is definitely in the motion. The uh, the work is being done, and simply because the old system was not working. Because when th and, and, and we all system that. in the last exactly. 12 years. Thank you for <laughs> not, that not in the 12 years because that. free medication Correct. did not come on board last 12 years ago. It was during those last four years. But they haven't been free because they haven't been available. It was available in certain places. Certain pharmacies were not stocking it. You Maybe complained about I it did. at I Parliament. Did. Because you knew your consumers were coming to you complaining. I'm not, that I'm not denying not that. I'm not denying that. Saying I'm saying yes. So I'm now saying yes. you're saying and that there's a new policy in place. Correct. Correct. And to correct going that forward, system. the medication will be available at all private pharmacies, correct. the 172. That's right. So for listeners to know that Fiji First is saying 172 medications, <coughs> which are free, are available at all pharmacies, including private pharmacies, and they will not run out of stock? No, because it's a private... I mean, from, from pharmacies... From 1st January. From 1st January. If pharmacies will be selling their medication. Don't they want to do business? From so obviously they'll be... Thank you very yeah. much. Because uh, the budget was read for this financial year. Now, going forward, uh, we'll start with uh, NFP's uh, Sini Nambo. Sure. What is your party's plan on the health sector going forward? Yep, going forward, we plan to bring in a national health, uh, health system. So, <coughs> yep, and we also want what to... What does that mean? What is a new health it system? It means we want to reform and, and just have a good look at the healthcare services of... Uh, that the people are using right now. You have issues where people are um, lined up in mattresses in the, in the hospital, uh, hospital corridors. You have issues where people have to bring up their own cotton wool. Again, this issue about um, medicines, um, it's not very uh, friendly for the taxpayers. Neither is it cost effective. So what will you do for So we'll have to have like a national health service which looks into all of these issues. <laughs> so by when will you implement what I you I can tell decide? you the specifics tomorrow, Vijay. Okay. Not me, but the listeners who are listening sure. out there. So Delpa. Thank you. I mean, if you're looking at the uh, main urban centers that have been serviced still by health centers, they should be upgraded to hospitals. For example, Valilevu Health Center should be a hospital by now. Serviced by ambulances, which by the way, we received 220 ambulances. We still don't see them on the road. People still wait for ambulances up to two, three hours. And it's most unfortunate that we've had this promised and it hasn't happened. We're also looking at subsidizing dialysis treatment um, for our patients, which mm -hmm. is so expensive right now. And this government hasn't done anything about it. $250 a session, and you're looking at five days a week. It's too much for someone to bear, and it cuts into their FNPF and the family struggle. More mental treatment facilities. Mental health has not been addressed by this government, and it's a huge problem. You just have to look at the amount of deaths caused by NCDs that are related to stress. We are not looking after our citizens in terms of mental health facilities and mental health treatments, so that we need to decentralize these to our hospitals and health centers, even out in the rural areas. Uh, an introduction of a national health insurance scheme so that people have access to insurance that is affordable and also that they can access when they are able, uh, going to the hospital and uh, can get treatment overseas um, also. Looking at, um, you know, at things also like um, 
the, as the free medicine has been mentioned, but ensuring that this medicine is available and ensuring that we're bringing it from sources that they're not just generic medication from countries that are supplying us that that uh, even sometimes um, are stated by doctors to be um, plus, um, to be um, just test uh, drugs and not actual um, medication that are helping our our people. So we've got to look into that to ensure that this medication is actually available, not something that wasn't available as it's been stated by Pramila and now is going to be available. So Delta government will ensure that they are available as soon as possible to our people. Now Linda, just in relation to that, of course you've said you'll do more. Have you done your figures, how much more you have to allocate for the health sector? Um, not with me entirely. Um, you know, I um, know that this policy is contained in our manifesto. Now, of course, we've got to get to Parliament, and then it's an issue of um, seeing what the need is and allocating the budget accordingly. They've got to be prioritized because this is an essential service. Just like education, just like social welfare, these are essential services for our people. Well, my question is, have you done your numbers and how much more could it cost? Certainly, it's been done by our party and that information is available from our party. So how can people who are listening today who want to find out more how much you will allocate to the health sector and how money will be allocated, where can they find that information? We have that information available with us. They can certainly contact me or the party. You can't tell us now? Not right now. Can I comment on that? <coughs> yeah. For health uh, sector, no, it's yes. your, your time oh, now, it's health my sector. Time? Okay, great. Uh, for the next budget, this, this is this financial year. The government has allocated $338 million, and this is to upgrade certain hospitals and also to provide uh, access to private doctors. Like what has been happening, most of our hospital has been uh, congested. A lot of people going in for very simple ailments, ailments like cough, flu, cold. So what the government has decided that uh, people who are earning 30000 and below they can access private doctors. And again, the private doctors, this, this is the general GPs, they will be billing the government. So they're introducing that system just to free up the hospital. And the other one is dialysis. <coughs> in fact, the dialysis center has been set up, right? And the program is rolling out in December. And the, uh, and the cost of the dialysis will be $75 per session. And those who are earning over 30,000, they will be paying $150 per session because Lambasa in Lambasa, the dialysis services is already providing $150 per session. So that is one of the program. Then for the Lotoka and Bar Hospital, government is going into public-private partnership just to provide the tertiary uh, treatments to the patient because they want to specialize in certain areas. And uh, VJ, one has to note if you look at the uh, hospitals and some of the health centers, uh, they have not been upgraded ever since our independence. So if each government had done something in upgrading those facilities, today we wouldn't be in that situation. So the idea is to upgrade those facilities. Already we had a manpower issue, like the doctors and nurses. Uh, about $44 million has been allocated to increase their salary so that we can retain them. So these are some of uh, the areas where the government is working. You're on Straight Talk, and uh, we have our guest tonight, uh, Premila Kumar of Fiji First, Seni Nambo of uh, National Federation Party, and Linda Tambuya of Sodelpa. We'll go to a short break and be right back. Straight Talk with VJ Narayan, brought to you by Extra Supermarket, continues after the break. <laughs> Tauriau Sua garu mai to soba kamalua Tauratale Tauriau Te kibu madana bunde ni marau Tauratale Tauriau Sua garu mai to soba kamalua Tauratale Tauriau, te kibu, 
Welcome back, listeners and viewers. Uh, we are back uh, on Straight Talk. And yes, uh, tonight uh, our guests are Sodelpa's Linda Tambuya, a National Federation Party, Seni Nambo, and uh, Fiji First's uh, Premila Kumar. We'll go into the issue that uh, uh, you women uh, wanted to talk about earlier. As I said, we will get into this issue <coughs> later on in the program, and that's about national minimum wage rate. Now, we had to pwn Raunindalo, the Hope Party leader here last night, and she has clarified to us uh, the $10 that she had said is not a national minimum wage rate. It will be coming in as something that if any business wants to take up, and uh, then they will offer them uh, tax breaks and other things, and that will be decided later. Nothing will be forced on any employer, and uh, they, she had made it clear on Straight Talk last night. Now... We wanted to know uh, in relation to uh, minimum wage, of course, a lot has been said and uh, also some business houses have come out and said there will be job losses and people are getting concerned about this issue. Uh, we'll start off with Sodelpa. How will you implement the minimum wage rate and uh, how will you ensure that there are no job losses? How will you ensure that prices of items will not go up uh, because the people will be employers will be paying more to their employees. Thank you. Um, you know, you've obviously um, addressed two issues, which is the four dollar minimum wage, and also being able to afford the cost of living. Now, the four dollar minimum wage um, has been a fight um, over the last few years. It has, it's not something new. It's something that um, certainly the unions have been fighting for uh, because they deal day to day with our workers that struggle living on $2.68 minimum wage. Now, of course, there have been no studies done. And you can look this up, but even from the World Bank or ADB, there have been no studies done to show that when you increase the minimum wage, that there are job losses. So the Attorney General the other day said a study will be done. Where is that study? You know, we are talking about increasing the minimum wage and to help our people out of poverty, 
and this study has not been done. And for a person that touts facts and figures and having all the information with him, he does not have the information to justify criticizing the $4 minimum wage. Now, how will Sadalpa implement this? Of course, it takes, as soon as we get into government, it's going to be in the first 100 days that we will increase the minimum wage to $4 an hour because it really is, it's not <coughs> ideal, but it's a start. And we need to look after our people. Now, in terms of the cost of living, we are going to be removing VAT from up to 20 items um, you know, uh, that we are looking at, basic food items that, um, that we uh, would like to see, uh, you know, that our people are able to afford. We'll go so to taxes just, and duties later. This yes. is just about minimum wage yes, rate, Linda. So because that the, you know, the VAT will be removed um, from basic food items, then our people will be able to afford um, on a decent minimum wage, which is $4. Linda, just before we move to National Federation <coughs> Party, has Sodelpa done a survey and analysis on $4 an hour already? Well, that has come certainly, as I had mentioned, when the People's Democratic Party came into Sodelpa, we brought that fight with us. Because as a party created by the Fiji Trade Union Congress, and over the years being our fight, this has been in consultation with employers, and also government. Do you have a survey report that you can furnish to us? There isn't a survey report, but it certainly is what has been agreed to in terms of the employers and those that we have Which been employees have agreed? the last few years. We've had employers uh, making statements otherwise. Well, certainly. I mean, you've had the head of the textile industry saying that there will be job losses. But I say to him, open up his books and prove it. Show us his numbers where he's going to lose um, uh, get people to lose jobs if he's going to increase the minimum wage. I think they're just protecting their profits. I mean, for many years they've benefited from tax-free industry, the textile industry, and having people working at such a minimal low wage, they've made huge profits. And they take it out of the country. So it's time so how to raise you, uh, the standard for, of our from, garment from, workers. From Sodelpa's point of view, if, for example, this whole industry is saying they do, do not want this minimum wage rate, how will you implement it? Will you force it down? It will become policy, it will become law, yes. It will become law. And what yes. if they, uh, they let people go? But that's exactly the point, is that they should not be causing job losses. They'll shut their business and off their the go. minimum wage. No, my, my question for Sodelpa yes. is, what if these factories say, we'll let, let go of 100, 200 people here from but these factories? But if they let people go, they will reduce productivity and they won't be producing. If they hire people to replace them, they have to pay the $4 minimum wage. There's no way to go. They may as well retain the people who are there, have been working for them for years, loyal to them, and increase the minimum wage so to $4. So you'll have the law, $4, and that's it. If the employees say, uh, we will let people go, you will not that have is, any protection for those people? Then it's not because of the $4 minimum, minimum wages. They're protecting their profits. And they will have to hire people <coughs> to replace to keep their productivity up. If they want to let people go, then that they're going to lose productivity. And they don't want that. Thank you, Sadelpa. NFP, Seni Nambu, uh, what's your stand on national minimum wage rate? On uh, You know that the businesses have made statements in relation to that. And uh, what is the NFP stand? Certainly. And let me just qualify initially first. Uh, because... Uh, uh, when our party leader was here with the <coughs> Fiji First General Secretary, there was that long debate about it as well. And Professor Biman Prasad predicted that the Fiji First General Secretary would go and talk to the uh, garment factory owners, which he did. And we have this on uh, good authority. Oh, we've asked the AG and it's been confirmed already that he went to meet the garment factory workers. Right. So it's not surprising also that the textile um, uh, industry is um, anxious. Uh, but Professor Bima, and that is the poly party policy, there will be no job losses because we've also heard from other employees that they can afford this $5 minimum wage. Employees or employers? Employers, I'm sorry. Employees, of <coughs> course, they would want more. Sure. But, uh, and this is also part of our solution to growing our middle class. The poverty rates, I think uh, Professor Prasad has laid it out quite uh, eloquently when he came. There's that poverty um, those be living be below the poverty line, which is about 20-something percent, and then those that hover just above that, they're at great risk of declining into that stage of, of poverty. That is, a, is a, a serious concern to us. So in terms of the $5 minimum wage, we stand by it. Obviously, I think Fiji First is 
keen to pursue its two dollars sixty eight. That's up to the people to decide. We w- we want you to tell us about NFP. Sure. We'll ask Fiji so first after this. So we are sticking this. to Fiji, um, <laughs> Fiji first to five dollar um, living wage, and there will be no job losses because we will ensure that we have that consultation to also make sure that people who don't pay the two dollars sixty eight, some of which are in the garment industry, you know, there's a problem there with enforcement of the laws as it is right now. So if they're not meeting that minimum um, baseline, why? And yet they want to jump up and down about $5. We want investment. But as, as legislators, which we're all hoping to be, we have to look at balance, VJ. Now, will you force it on the people who do not want to pay? Absolutely. I mean, if it's a law, it's not an option. That's why consultation is important. And Fiji First is known to fast track laws without consultation. We are not about that. So if you will have consultations, when will you implement the minimum wage rate? We've said that it can happen within the first 100 days. We will work day and night to ensure that those consultations happen. Thank you, Seni Nambu of National Federation Party. Fiji first, Premila Kumar. Okay, uh, I think um, our General Secretary made it very clear that we believe in sustainable system to be put in place uh, to go forward. And as I said previously, not a single government introduced minimum wages. It was Fiji First government that first introduced minimum wages, and they had set it at two dollars, increased it to two thirty-two, and then to two sixty-eight. And what we are saying now that we will conduct a study to see the sustainability by how much we can increase, and it will not only for the uh, unskilled workers; it will be across the board. So that is the stand the party has. But let me just correct some of the inaccuracies that we just mentioned a while ago. Like Linda has asked why the government did not do the study. Let me make it clear. I mean, $4 is your proposal. You do the study. It's not our proposal. Previously, whatever our proposal was, we have done our study. And based on that, that the increases were made. And uh, we're not picking figures from the air. We will conduct a study, as we have said. We have made it known. And based on this study of sustainability, we will decide what would be the minimum wages. Because here, I think one of the problem is that if we're going to increase the wages without looking at the sustainability <coughs> angle of things, some of these garment factories will lay the workers, right? Or they can simply shut the business and move out of this country because there are other lucrative markets out there. It's not that if they're going to let people go, they're going to recruit more people. It's not going to happen that way if you're going to set the minimum wage of $4. So it, there is a possibility of job losses. We have heard it from the Garment uh, Association. There has never been any studies done and no proof that there are job losses caused by increasing minimum wage. You show me one proof and one report in any country and I will believe you, but okay. there isn't. So there in isn't, other w- it doesn't cause job losses. Yes, employers will jump up and down. They don't want to pay more to employees. But it is time. It's high time. Our people are suffering. They're poor. They can't afford basic I, I food think, items. I think your you proposal, have your proposal by is, noodles. Your proposal is such, food to eat. Your proposal is such that it's going to create more poverty. If people are laid off, they will not have a job. No, if you continue to pay them $2.68, they 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 are already poor. Nothing about job losses. That's why it's offset by the social wages. But it's not enough. Because we want to to create jobs. We want the economy to grow. We all want the economy to grow. But But with your proposal, it's going to go. Let's talk about the economy. I think we've addressed this issue because we'll talk about this all night. I think you've got a lot of issues to say here. But the main issue here is that you have differing policies. You are saying you will increase the minimum wage rate. You don't have your studies. Uh, You are saying that you will do a study. Uh, we I have believe been doing 18, the study. Uh, there'll be an 18 month uh, consultation Correct. period and then you'll come up with something. Uh, you have said in 100 days, uh, NFP, that you will ensure that that is done, day and night consultation, sure. and you will go with $5 minimum wage. And also, you will have in your law that employers cannot lay off employees. No, that's not correct. That's you what your leader no, has no. said. That's what your leader has said okay, already. Okay, well, I'm, I need to check that. Now, moving on just to taxes and duties. Now, we have heard a lot about reduction of uh, taxes, but of course, 
the main engine of the government runs through taxes and duties. You need that for government services. Now, if you don't have that, you cannot uh, have uh, money to uh, spend on the different allocations that you want to uh, go into. Uh, just a question for Seni Nambo mm -hmm. at National Federation Party on taxes and duties. Uh, what will you increase and what will you decrease? Have more discussions taken place? Uh, a lot of that will be made available tomorrow, BJ. But one thing that we are firm on is the sheer wastage by this government on, on certain uh, expenditure items that are just wasteful. Uh, you've got things like it's been cut now, but for three years, Fiji Airways had $18 million, $18 million for marketing the Singapore route. What has been the return to, you know, the people of Fiji? There's also other areas, and then there's the $9 million golf tournament. That's not happening anymore, I understand, because there's a lot of pressure about it. Some of the, um, and then there's, um, in terms of taxes, I think one of the things that we will really need to look at carefully is the port charges. We've privatized the ports. And some of those costs um, have been passed on to the consumer, which is which is uh, exacerbating some of the high costs of some of our uh, products. But the specific reductions or increases in taxes and duties, you can't tell us? Tomorrow, BJ. How about Sodelpa, Linda Tambuya? One of our main industries, the tourism industry, is suffering because of taxes. This government has introduced the ECAL and STT, which are so high, up to about 25% total, that our tourists are paying ridiculous amounts of money, not just to come here, but also to buy and uh, spend money on our hotels. So we are actually losing tourists. We're having, we're having people that are going to other destinations now, like Bali. Tourist arrivals have actually increased. I saw exactly, the survey. not losing tourists. 885,000 so far and still going. Well, I mean, certainly what it will happen is, is that with people... Uh, choosing other destinations, we could have more. And there's more and more complaints. But, but I'm saying the tourist more arrivals more are increasing. So what, what is your assessment of that? Well, they obviously prefer Fiji as a destination. But if we aren't careful about continuing to impose this on our hotels and our restaurants, then they will continue to have to increase the prices of their goods and services to our tourists and they will be affected to the point where they will choose other destinations. So Linda, what, what taxes and duties are you looking at, increasing or decreasing? Well, we're going to remove ECAL for sure and STT. I mean, we just go with what is owed on VAT and uh, focus on that. We've got to be able to allow our hotel operators um, and other restaurant operators to be able to uh, operate in an environment where they can provide the services happily and freely to our tourists. I mean, our tourists, yes, they're coming to this country, but, you know, we will be suffering when these um, taxes continue to be introduced because people are choosing other destinations. We could have more tourists coming uh, to our countries. But we are, yes, they are increasing in numbers, but we are losing them to other countries. And if we aren't careful, then our tourism industry will continue to decline as a result of these taxes. It's not declining, Vijay. It's, tourism industry is not declining. Let get, let's get the facts right. Well, the figure is 885,000 and increasing. That's, that's the latest figure that but I've got from Reserve Bank But it's not increasing in the Fiji. same rate. They're not it increasing at the same rate. It continues to increase. But, uh, if you compare the rates... Apart from, I'll give you... Uh, some more time on taxes and duties. Yes. You said that you you will uh, remove ECAL and STT. By the way, for our listeners, uh, environment levy and service turnover tax. That's the two yes. uh, that uh, Linda is talking about. Thank you. Uh, what other taxes and duties you will increase or decrease? Well, what we've seen in terms of you the, can't the decrease tax everything rate. because then you'll be yes, losing revenue. Are. I mean, look, uh, you know, we have reduced import duties on on items uh, that really we should be looking at discouraging imports. We have. 100% and over more imports on food coming to the country. We need to be looking at increasing domestic um, uh, provision of food rather than having so much imported because the taxes, so we've got zero taxes now on fruit and vegetables. Why aren't we planting our own local fruit and vegetables to sustain it? So we are now giving tax breaks for imported fruit and vegetables and so that needs to be uh, relooked at, and that we need You'll to increase the, the tax duty on. Fruits. We need to because we need to increase. We wouldn't uh, want local to. Uh, we, we wouldn't want to pay duty on oranges and apples and. Well, I think grapes. we should because we should be looking we at should? increasing local production of our fruit and vegetables. So instead, so using that money to discourage more imports. So you will increase and duty on imported fruit. 
absolutely an imported foods. We should be discouraging uh, uh, the importation of food. We should be able to be a sustainable country with what we have here. There's an investment opportunity. So that's that a recipe locally. for increasing Please, cost just of a moment. life. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm answering the question that we should increase local production of our fruit Popo, pineapple, watermelon, all of that, we should be sustaining our hotel industry. Why are we allowing overseas fruits to be replacing our local produce? We should get our people to be planting so that we can actually, we should be exporting. So which, uh, which fruit will you increase the duty on and by how much? Well, we've got all the fruits that are coming now. They're all the imported fruits and uh, vegetables are zero duty. We should be charging that to discourage what's coming from outside because we've got to be able to sustain our own food supply. What level of duty? will you impose? Well, we've got we to gotta look at, you know, either 10% or 15%. 10 or 15% yes. from 0%. Yes. Anything else on taxes and duties? You well, would like to tell the people of Fiji about from Sadelpa's point of view? Well, I mean, it, is, it comes back to, uh, you know, to the kinds of taxes that are available. For example, now uh, the duties on cars less than two years old. we got traffic jams. It's crazy. And it's only being exacerbated by more cars on the road. We've got to increase the duty again on these cars so that we discourage more cars coming to this country, we get an efficient bus service okay, that allows e-ticketing, cash and, and card so that people will use that transport more. We don't even have enough roads to sustain the traffic. What's Fiji First going to do about it? Nothing. Back-to-back -back traffic everywhere. And so this is because there are more cars on the road and they've made it easier for cars to come in on very low or zero uh, taxes. We now need we to bring those import duties back. I'll give Fiji First uh, because you have mentioned Fiji First but what will you do for taxes and duties, uh, Fiji First Premier? Okay, for taxes and duties, already the taxes and duties are pretty low on imported goods, particularly imported uh, food, food item. It's very low. That's why fruits and vegetables were made 0%. Previously, Fiji First government had put uh, fruits and vegetables under 32%, reduced it to 15%, and now 0%. Why? Because that was an outcry from the public. They wanted the fruits and vegetables. We cannot rely on people and leaving it to the market that somebody is going to produce somewhere our fruits and vegetables and sell it to us. We are running a tourism industry. They need a regular supply. So it was for this reason the duty went down for fruits and vegetables and also for NCD reasons. But in, for Fiji First cases, we have already reduced the VAT. We, we have already reduced the duty on food items. But going back to what uh, uh, Linda has said about STT and ECAL, let me make it very clear. STT and ECAL, even though it was introduced to, the, uh, to businesses whose uh, investment is over $1.25 million, you can see that the tourism sector is still thriving. Tourists are still coming. The numbers have gone up. And then I'm very worried with her statement where she has said that imported food items, they will increase the duty. That's a perfect recipe for increasing the cost of living. I mean, we have got a very confused policies being discussed here on this table. And we have got NFP who don't even have a policy to share this evening. I did he make it clear. The opportunity to speak. I did so, make so it clear that we are going, going to, to be discuss discussed that tomorrow. tomorrow. Yes. So why, why did we have this session today? Well, you're just regurgitating what you've already done. So there's absolutely nothing new coming from Fiji first, to be clear. Premila? Uh, definitely, they're all new things that we are talking about. The problem with these two parties is they have nothing tell us new. What's our problem. That is, Let's talk there about is policies. nothing new to add. In fact, what they're going to do is no creative ideas, no new ideas on this table. Whatever Fiji first is doing, we'll either increase it, do it, remove it, or do it better. Well, that's that's what the, let's does. move to the next in. issue. This, this, we've, uh, we've discussed this okay. issue. I want let's to discuss this, this issue. NCD issue because Pramila, uh, I recall an MP's workshop where, as a CEO of a yes, Mutra, yes, absolutely, you were there and you were uh, lamenting this issue about NCDs. Correct. And then when the uh, Fiji First MPs, your MPs, said, "Oh, you know, we can't, uh, you know, reduce uh, increase uh, duties on junk food and all this," and then two budgets later, zero. Nothing. In the last budget, there was um, all, all those zero rated fruits and vegetables are the kinds of fruits and vegetables that hotels enjoy, not so much the, the average person. And then zero, zero comment on the fact that um, noodle seasoning was zero rated and CDs. And then, of course, aerated drinks that are imported, which benefits one company who makes it here. 
No comment again from Consumer Council. Let me let me clarify that because that's a wrong information going out to the public. It's in the budget documents. The, there, yes, yes. I'm also making reference to the budget document. All the sugar sweetened beverages sold in this country has copped higher taxes. Important. And this is imported yes. as well as produced. Both. That wasn't clear to me. Get, the budget get your, get your I facts shall right. check that. There's Please more duties that. on those items, and it was made clear, I think, in relation to uh, alcohol and cigarettes as well. They said that they termed them as sin goods. Now, it's 12 years later. 12 years is a long time. Now, Three we'll, terms of government. Let's, moving on to the next issue, uh, uh, women. Uh, what more can we do to deal with cases of abuse of women and children? We start off with Linda. Thank you. Uh, you know, this uh, nationwide crisis, I call it, uh, will need to be addressed, uh, you know, in a nationwide way. And I believe, uh, you know, that we need to see a behavioral change in our people. <clears throat> we need to inculcate, uh, you know, the mutual feelings and basic values of respect that should start from uh, the school curriculums as well as uh, uh, um, advocating uh, more uh, against, uh, uh, against the uh, abuse against women and children. And that takes, again, political will. It's got to be from that level where we ensure that there is behavioral change from our people so that there's respect. Now this, again, like I said, it starts from schools and then it, it permeates up. And also our discipline forces you know, with domestic violent, violence cases, the police force, there is a lot of abuse of the DVRO. And that has shown, with putting that in place, how domestic violence cases are dealt with, where uh, the police aren't taking these cases very seriously. They're taking it very lightly, and there's forcing of uh, complainants and uh, uh, um, abusers. Uh, to reconcile and also to go and work it out. I mean, there, there are reasons why these laws have been put in place to be able to help those that have been abused to be protected. And so we need more institutions and uh, a shift in uh, behavior and thoughts. Now, victims of crimes, they are the ones that are victimized the most by their families. And so they need to be protected by the law. And I would recommend that we have a um, victim's uh, safe houses where they can go and even after a case is disposed of, they would be able to be rehabilitated and brought back into the community because usually uh, cases of violence against women and children are in family situations more than strangers. And so this needs to be dealt with on, the, on that level. And it is a nationwide crisis. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Premila of Fiji First, uh, what's your comment <coughs> on what more can be done to deal with cases of abuse of women and children? I think a lot needs to be done in that area. Uh, we often hear uh, abuses which are, which are reported in the media. And I understand that it was under Fiji First government that we've got the Domestic Violence Act in place. Uh, there has to be more awareness on it, more training is required. Uh, and I do agree with Linda, uh, even though the training is provided, but when it comes to the person who has been trained, we don't know in that isolated area how he or she has understood and how they're carrying out that work. But from a policy perspective, the policies are there. It's a matter of implementation and how it gets properly impl uh, implemented. But in domestic violence cases, I think the family definitely needs a lot of support from others as well, because you know when there is an abuse, the children are there, they are affected, um, and th there can be psychological effects. So based on that, I feel that we got to have more centers where more counseling can be done uh, to the victim and the, and the children who also suffer with the victim. And, 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 and just the last thing, we need to go away from these traditional ideas of uh, masculinity, you know, masculine people and how the man can behave traditionally, you know, it's expected that a woman will listen to the man and woman is a property. So that needs to be inculcated 
or the message needs to go out that women are not a property, they're human beings and they have equal rights in our society. Thank you, Pramila. That's the voice of Fiji first there. Now the voice of NFP, Seni Nambu. Thanks, Fiji. I think uh, on this issue there is consensus around this table yeah. that violence in any form is unacceptable. We are not barbarians in the uh, caveman era. On this issue of DVRO, though, um, there Domestic are Violence Restraining Order, order. for those Correct. who are wondering. Yes, sorry. Um, uh, there is a no-drop policy, I understand, uh, for domestic violence. Yes, that's right. Correct. Now, this, this law has been in effect for quite a while. Some of the um, scenarios that we've heard from the people is that the definition of violence has been extended somewhat. So it's not uh, a, a male-female uh, power play uh, in terms of physical manifestation of it. Violence is also now including uh, an issue where a daughter-in-law feels that she's been physically or verbally um, abused by her mother-in-law such that she will take action against her mother-in-law. And that, that, that throws up a really awkward situation because in those, once it's reported, the police have to come in, you're separated, oh, I'm sorry, you're separated. And that, so people who have, were involved in the formulation of the law have said this law should have been reviewed late, you know, within the first five years because there are new and emerging issues, clearly as you know, that situation, that have to, and the laws have to be in step with the realities on the ground. Thank you very much, uh, Seni. Now, uh, what more can be done for the minority groups in the country? What about the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex and queer community as their rights are also protected now under the 2013 Constitution? Prabila, for Fiji first. Uh, I think uh, one has to accept a simple fact that uh, under Fiji first government, uh, they tried to remove, in fact, they have removed the, dis the discrimination that existed. And let me just talk about that discrimination. That was the first step towards providing rights to uh, LGBT community. Uh, this was a homosexual acts in privacy was criminalized previously, whereas heterosexual acts were legal. So that has been removed. Uh, so it's a plus point in a way that we are working towards giving uh, LGBT community the equal rights. I think the bigger problem here is the societal problems where there is a limited or what I would call it acceptance of this particular community. So I believe that what needs to be done is more awareness and uh, here uh, if we can have the NGOs who can work towards it and at the end of the day, it's about attitude of a, of a person. And, you know, attitudes don't change overnight. It takes a lot of time. And I think we need to work towards that, raising this awareness so that we can embrace them and accept them. NFP is uh, Seni Nambu. So on the issue of LGBTQ, I think we've put out an opinion piece on this. I think there tends to be a lot of phobia around uh, this issue. But let's, I think there will be uh, agreement, maybe, around the table that these individuals, they are our sons and daughters, they are mm. our flesh and blood. Correct. Yeah. Number one, I think we can agree mm. on that. Where the issue becomes problematic, I think because of societal you know, perceptions, is that uh, everybody will automatically jump to the issue of safe sex, same sex uh, marriage and all this. It's not about that. Mm. Most of these individuals want respect because of who they are, so that they can get a job, whether they wear a dress, if they're a male, they will not be discriminated because they're wearing a dress. There's been a lot of deaths of some members of this LGBTQ community, possibly based on uh, you know discrimination. What you do behind your bedroom door is yours. But when it comes to a law such as this, incidentally, not a lot of people have brought this up to our attention in our consultations. But in something like this, it's very sensitive. We're going to say, all right, um, to the members of the community, if you want such a law, please talk to the, you know, the churches, talk to the other members. You, we need to have a common understanding first about what a law should consist of before we take it to Parliament. Thank you, Seni. Uh, Linda Tambuya of Sodelpa. Thank you. I just want to point out that um, the um, removal of discrimination based on sexual orientation actually was introduced in the 1997 Constitution, not the 2013 Constitution, and that was the 1997 Constitution under Rambuka's leadership, 
and uh, which was widely consulted, and it added that you could not discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. Now, as far as uh, bringing uh, to pass about um, decriminalizing um, uh, homosexual activity, this was actually brought about by the courts in the McCoska case. So it wasn't something that Fiji first came it up It came with. out in it the Crimes actually, Act. Yes, but it was because... In 2009. The, correct, but because the law, the court case uh, of Mikoska had actually held that it was to be decriminalized. And so, yes, Parliament follows the court case to implement it. And that is something that Parliament does once a court case is, is brought and made a decision. And that's what's supposed to happen. Yes, when you follow the judicial system, judiciary, which is independent of government. Now, My question to you was, uh, what more can be done? Oh, correct. I think there needs to be a better um, uh, protection for our um, our gay citizens. Uh, you know, uh, just in the last year alone, we've had two murders, two murders that are still unsolved, that are still being investigated, of uh, two young men, gay men, that have been found brutally murdered, one in the seawall and one at Wanivula at the crossing, and we still don't know where those cases are. The one I mean, at the seawall, the guy has been charged already. Correct, but it's still in the courts, and it's taking, you know, that the, the system, the, the um, processing courts, but, it, but I'm coming back to the discrimination that these, uh, that our gay citizens who are brothers and sisters um, come across and they just want, they need more protection. They cannot be discriminated based on their sexual orientation or be told that you should all get on a ship and be shipped to Iceland, which is what the Prime Minister and the leader of <laughs> Fiji First Party has said about gay people. So I'd like for Pramila to respond to that. How can he even say that he's not discriminating against gay people when he has made that statement in public? And shame on him for saying that. These are citizens that should be treated with respect and not discriminated upon on his own constitution but first initialized in the 1997 constitution. My question was what more can be done? We'll uh, move on to the next question in relation to education and uh, one of the main issues that people have uh, raised the issue on. Uh, what's your view on sex education in schools to ensure that young people are well versed on issues like sexually transmitted infections and teenage pregnancies? Seni Nambo of NFP. One of the things that we've talked about quite um publicly for a while now is the fact that our, uh, we need an ec education commission, right, to just have an overhaul about the curriculum. Everything about education from primary to secondary. Related to this issue about sex education is the act as it stands right now, s s in section three I believe it is, Education <coughs> Act, it says that the um, permanent secretary will I'm paraphrasing, give education subject to what the parents and want. You can check it out for yourself. I'm paraphrasing. So sex education, if that is so, if that is a need, then I would like to see that the parents are actively involved in that need, that they say, yes, my kid, my child should have this, I agree. It's not something for the government to just say, sex education tomorrow. Doesn't work that way. So it should be consulted. consulted. Pramila Kumar of Fiji first? Well, I've been a teacher, as well as a teacher educator, as I mentioned before. Sex education is part and parcel of curriculum, and it is taught to the children. STDs so, too? You said STDs. Yeah, sexually transmitted disease, yes. So all that is being taught to the children so that they prepare themselves for the future. It's already there. So what more can we do? It's already there. So DELPA is concerned for our children today. What we see, we, the digital age is here. So our children can access any kind of material, even if inappropriate, on the internet. This has become a huge problem, and if we do not address and educate our children in school about these issues, that how it should be done responsibly, then we will continue to face issues of increased sexual offenses, the younger, you're going to have continue to have younger and younger victims and younger and younger offenders. And those under 10 are not criminally responsible. But we have seen cases of those that are younger than 10 that are committing these crimes. Now, the access of free internet by this government, which is free Wi-Fi, is responsible in our view. 
irresponsible in our view. We can even see children who are after school in uniforms, accessing the internet, watching porn in free Wi-Fi zones. Are they even having anyone monitoring these children? So you don't want With free Wi-Fi zones? Certainly not. Certainly not. It has to be done responsibly. If you provide free Wi-Fi, do it in the schools. Do it completely in the school where they are being supervised. Then maybe they'll be watching it in school. The teachers will be there to supervise them. With free Wi-Fi, it is to be used responsibly for research and any other thing that is educational, that is wholesome, and that will help our children to educate them. But the access to this and the internet, you only have to type an incorrect word in Google and you will get up so many porn sites and they will just say, yes, I'm over 13, and access it. So we need to provide sex education in the schools so that our children keep up with what is inundated to them. Just a follow-up question on uh, Wi-Fi zones. So will Sodelpa remove the free Wi-Fi zones that are being launched at the moment? We will not remove them, but we will move them to appropriate zones like schools where they can be supervised and monitored and they can use it for research purposes, especially for our school children. Now, obviously for adults, they are responsible. They are able to access uh, this material and it's not the responsibility of the government to govern adults over 18 years old. But I'm talking about school children and they are accessing these free Wi-Fi zones. No responsibility, no follow-up, no supervision. That is an irresponsible government. Fiji, first, uh, that's your policy to have that? Your yes, response? yes, definitely that's the policy. I mean, I would like to ask Linda, she's concerned about this free Wi-Fi in public places. How will she monitor all those small businesses, the cafes uh, that are running and providing internet where children are also accessing and their parents who leave their kids in these internet cafes to go to nightclub. That's a very good point, Pramila. What has your government done about it? These internet That's cafes, mm -hmm. under the, in the last 12 years, internet has only been introduced. The last 15, 20 years and 12 years most, your government has been running. This is now, where these children have been left. You're correct. Mm. They have been left and the police have been yeah, trying to supervise internet cafes. And our children are left there. They go to clubs. They leave their children there. And they have what's called um, packages where you can actually stay overnight, our children. And yes, they're underage. Why aren't there yeah. policies by Fiji First to protect our children? Fiji First, Fiji First cannot intervene into a personal absolutely matter. Absolutely you can for small you businesses. You can't. You, you can, can't. You can put policies no, no, to regulate small that's, businesses. That's where the police are there. That's right, under your watch. Yeah, let so us why speak. Aren't Linda, you'll get your chance, Linda. Let that's where speak. the police is there to monitor and they, are, they have been uh, taking or closing down some of the internet cafes, depending upon what time they open, where they open. But the point here is I think we should be talking about parental responsibility as well. Everything cannot be regulated. Everything cannot be regulated by policies. That, okay, we're going to make a policy. Please don't leave your kids there and I'm going to listen to it. So, you know, we need to understand that, that, you know, there is something called parental responsibility as well and that needs to kick in. That's absolute. I agree with that. But how can parents monitor children when they're at work? It's their children. And the children are out in the parks accessing in the Time for a break. Zones. Thank you very much, women. Maybe you can discuss this over the break. <laughs> Talk with VJ Narayan. Brought to you by Extra Supermarket. Continues after the break.